Good morning. Welcome to the May webcast. Uh, my name is Jared Glines. I'm a territory service manager here at Manitowoc Ice Machines. Today we'll be covering safe mode for Indigo and Indigo Next. And also with Indigo Next, we have a new feature called Active Sense. Um, thanks for joining us today. We hope you can get something out of this. Throughout the course of the presentation today, we will be uh, having uh, the ability to uh, take and uh, answer questions. There will be question and answer uh, icon located in the top of your screen there. Uh, and so we'll be having somebody monitor that. And so you can click on that chat icon and ask questions and we'll do our best to answer your questions as we're going through. And then towards the end of the day when we get done, we're also going to have you take a quiz and this quiz will essentially allow you to go in and uh, test your knowledge, see how much uh, you learned today in regards to uh, safe mode and active sense. And then when you hit the submit and uh, submit for the quiz, uh, you'll provide your email address and your email uh, address will allow us to then, once you've submitted the quiz, send you not only a certificate of completion for doing this, but we'll also go ahead and provide you a PDF version of the um, presentation today. Uh, behind the scenes helping me, I've got Jason McDonald and Aaron Harder helping out behind the scenes. Uh, they're going to help me go through today and uh, hopefully we can get you some information to assist you guys in understanding when you see a safe mode or active sense. So on the legacy indigo, we'll start with the legacy indigo. Uh, if the machine's in safe mode, we might, it would say making ice and it's going to indicate that it's in safe mode below there. So what does that mean? What does it mean if we see this in the display? It means that we've sensed an active uh, water fault or an ice probe fault on this machine, okay? And in the, in the event that we do see an active ice probe fault or water fault, the control board is basically just using an internal control logic to look back at the uh, previous cycles to kind of get an idea of what it was doing before it sensed the uh, ice probe or the water level probe fault. The only two things that can initiate a safe mode in the Indigo machine would be a water fault or an ice probe fault. So essentially, it's going to try to help us get past uh, a, a water interruption or an ambient issue that created a water-related uh, fault or an ice thickness probe fault. If the ice thickness probe fault is sensed, the control board will look back at the last five cycles. It's going to kick out the longest one. It's going to kick out the shortest one. Take an average of the remaining three to say this is about how long it's been taking for me to be in the freeze cycle before I initiated a harvest cycle. And then that way it can get past uh, an ambient issue or, or something else creating that ice probe fault. Maybe the ice probe has failed uh, or maybe something else caused it to go into an active ice probe fault and it's going to be, be able to look back and do these time cycles based upon the information that uh, it had gathered over the previous cycles. Now, if something happens where whatever created the ice thickness probe fault clears itself out, maybe you had a straggler cube or something get caught on the ice probe during the last harvest, and then the machine goes through the, uh, the safe mode. It goes into the next cycle. We're going to allow the control board to still look actively at the ice thickness probe and the water probe to make sure that uh, maybe it'll go back to a point where the control board goes, OK, that seems a lot more normal. It seems like whatever created my fault is now cleared itself and we would go back into normal operation and go out of the safe mode. On the water level probe, on the water level probe, there's a few different things that can create a water uh, fault in the machine. Uh, if any of the following occur, if we're sensing on the high water level probe before the low water level probe, that will flag a water fault. Also, if our evaporator outlet temperature is less than minus 10 degrees at about the six and a half to seven and a half minute mark of the freeze cycle, uh, that would tell the control board, yeah, we probably don't have much load on the evaporator, likely don't have any water. That's going to flag a water fault. If our low probe is still satisfied or sensing water at the end of a harvest cycle, that will also flag a, a water fault. And then if the low or high water level probe, either one are satisfied at the end of the freeze cycle, those two, that two will also create a water fault or flag a water fault. We really want to take the water that's in that water trough and convert that to ice on the evaporator grid. So towards the end of the freeze cycle or the harvest cycle, we shouldn't be seeing water on that water level probe at all. We should have converted all the water we brought into that water trough to ice on the evaporator grid uh, so that we can initiate uh, and, and utilize that water uh, to make a, an entire sheet of ice. 
So as far as troubleshooting goes on the uh, uh, water level probe, if we do see that we're in the safe mode, it's either, again, an ice thickness probe fault or a water fault. Nothing else in this machine will initiate that safe mode. So we're going to go ahead and scroll into the service menu. We're going to find the event log. We'll scroll down in the event log. We're looking for E19 or E20. E19 is the uh, water fault, or uh, I'm sorry, the ice thickness probe fault, and E20 is going to be the water fault. We're going to find out which one of those is uh, causing the machine to go into the safe mode, and then we can look at our technician's handbooks for the proper troubleshooting for that water level probe or the ice thickness probe based upon which uh, active um, fault is causing the safe mode. Now, the other thing too, it can be a little bit tricky here, because if we did have a water interruption or something along those lines, uh, we're gonna flag the water fault, but then we're gonna go through a cycle with no water. And uh, when it goes into harvest based on time, that will also flag an ice thickness probe fault because the machine's gonna say, hey, I never sensed any ice. And so in some cases, especially with the water interruption, we can actually see both of those faults uh, um, in that service menu. So we'll just utilize our, our technician's handbooks and the proper troubleshooting for each of these components to determine which one of those um, initiated the safe mode. Now, if we go through our water probe uh, testing and we go through our ice thickness probe testing and everything checks out, it's functioning the way it should, uh, just try recycling power of the machine. Let the control board kind of scramble its memory a little bit and uh, go back and see if we had maybe some bad cycles in those last five that were causing us to have uh, some weird um, total times, those weird averages. All right, moving on to the Indigo next, the E20 water fault. After software version 8.6 is when we brought in the active sense. So after 8.6, that's the only, uh, the only thing that will initiate safe mode in Indigo next will be a water fault. We're going to allow the active sense to take over. We're going to cover that here in just a little bit. So uh, in this case, on with Indigo next on a active water fault, we will not show a triangle on the display, uh, but the machine will be in the safe mode, and it's going to be basing it about based on that same am amount of information. It's going to look at the last five fill times in the event that we get that water-related probe, uh, water probe fault, and uh, it's going to do time fills. But of course, uh, if the water probe does start functioning again, uh, normally what the control board would expect to see from that water fill valve, the, sh the machine is going to take itself out of safe mode and go back into normal operation to kind of get past a water interruption or or something along those lines. So that's the idea behind uh, the the um, safe mode is to kind of get us past uh, an ambient issue that may be occurring. And uh, so once that that water has been restored or, or again or something along those lines, the machine can go back into normal operation. Now, even though we won't show a triangle or the safe mode on the home screen with Indigo Next, if we did get a service call, we're out there, we're looking at this machine, trying to determine if there is something going on, we're going to go ahead and go into the service menu. And once again, in this case, we'll be looking for active water faults, the E20 water fault. By looking at the E20 water fault, we can see how many times it's sensed a water fault and the last date and time. So depending on the date and time, uh, if it's not today or yesterday when we got the phone call to come out and service a the machine, then likely that a water system, that water fault is not part of the reason why we got called out to, use, um, to service this piece of equipment. So in the detailed description, again, we'll see what kind of a fault it is. The, uh, uh, what it's named, the number of times, and the date and time of the last occurrence. So how do we test the water level probe? Well, the good news is on the legacy Indigo, old Indigo, and Indigo Next, we are going to troubleshoot them very similarly. Uh, they're giving the same kind of information back to the control board uh, on both models, uh, whether it's the Indigo or the Indigo Next. So we'll start out with a machine. Maybe we've got a situation where uh, we've got water overflowing the water trough. There's water contacting the water level probe, uh, but yet there's still water coming into the machine. So step one, this is actually printed word for word in the technician's handbook on troubleshooting. Step number one is we're going to turn a machine off to see if the water stops coming in. If we still have water coming into the machine, that machine is off. So we'll go ahead and grab our meters, go to the water inlet valve and look for line voltage to the water inlet valve. If we have line voltage at the water inlet valve, this machine is in the off state, nothing should be energized. 
and that means the relay on the board is stuck closed, so replacing the control board would resolve that. If we get into the water inlet valve and there is no voltage at the water inlet valve, check your water pressure. Make sure we haven't exceeded 80 PSI, which is our maximum allowable pressure for this machine. If we're above 80 PSI, that higher water pressure has the ability to sometimes force its way past the valve or that higher pressure makes it so when the valve de-energizes, it makes it difficult for the valve to close. So if our um, if we don't have voltage at the water inlet valve and we've got our water pressure within our acceptable range, then that, that uh, water inlet valve is stuck open mechanically. Replacing the water inlet valve would resolve that problem. What if the water does turn off when we turn off the machine? How come the control board could not see that the water trough was full? Obviously, we want to make sure the water probe is plugged into the onto the control board where the water probe plugs in. It's labeled HC and L, uh, high probe, common probe, and the low probe. Verify it's secure and plugged in. We can also go into the control board's um, real-time data screen. In this case, we go to the service menu, uh, re data, real-time data, and under the input section, we can see here what that water level probe is sensing back to the control board. In this case, we had a situation where the water trough was full. We had water making contact with the water level probe, but the control board says, yeah, I, I didn't see any water out there. That's how come I was still bringing water in. So why can't it see it? We can go ahead and ohm out that probe um, and go ahead and, and make sure that the probe, all three of those probes, or uh, have continuity back to the connector on the control board. We need to have that circuit closed so that the control board can see what's taking place out there in that water trough. And so if we do have not continuity on any one of those probes, we're gonna replace the water level probe and that water level probe harness. If we have a situation where we're not bringing water into the machine, we've got no water contact in the water level probe, water trough is not full. Uh, again, we can go into that real-time data screen to see if we have water uh, sensing at that control board. In this case, we don't have any water touching the water level probe, but the control board saying, oh, yeah, I saw the water trough was full out there. That's why I was still bringing water in. So what did, why did we see that? Well, the next step we're going to do is disconnect that water probe from the control board to see if it changes to not sensing. If it does, we'll go on to the next step. If we still got uh, this saying that it's sensing water and we don't even have a water probe plugged into the control board, uh, power the unit down, pop the control board out, look on the back and see if there's something back there stuck to the back of the board uh, making the connection for you. If there's nothing back there making the connection for you, replace the control board. It shouldn't be able to see water in the water trough if there's not even a water probe connected to the control board. If it does go to uh, not sensing, we can check to make sure. See if that water level probe is shorted. Uh, on this water uh, level probe, there are three wires, three different wi uh, wires there. If moisture uh, gets inside this water level probe, it will cause that water level probe to sense. Uh, if we, we have that situation, we'll go ahead and replace that water level probe and that harness. Uh, if we suspect that the water level probe is not sensing very well, we can go ahead and jump her out at the control board between H and C. Uh, that's the high and the common level, at which point we would expect to see the control board say, yep, I see the water now. And so if it still can't see the water level and you've got a jumper between high and common and it still doesn't see that water level in there, um, you need a control board in there that can see that. And so in that case, we would replace the control board in order to resolve that problem. On the older water level probe circuitry, we had a four pin connector. Uh, we were only using three of them, but the way that this was set up, the pins were a little bit... Uh, uh, suspect, I guess, if you will, uh, if you disconnected and reconnected that water level probe several times, uh, the female pins on the, on the uh, communication cable would start to spread out. Sometimes would get a little bit of corrosion in there, causing a, a loose connection. This would create maybe intermittent water faults from time to time. And because of that uh, connection, we decided we would go ahead and make a change. It was a running change. It's going back now about almost three years now. Uh, we made a running change. We wanted to get a little bit better, a more robust uh, water level probe connector there. We were only using three pins. We went to a true three pin connector. Uh, they're not the circular pins, they're kind of flat and they'll slide together like a blade. 
uh, type of a connector. There's also a little O-ring in there to try to help prevent that uh, um, moisture from getting in there and causing corrosion on that connector. And so that was an improvement that we did. So because of that, uh, there are a lot of machines out there with the older versions of that water level probe. So from day one, if you were ordering that water level probe with that new connector, the new connector will not plug into the old ones. You'll have to replace the communication cable with it. So uh, from day one, and it remains this way today, we are including that communication cable with that uh, water level probe, just in case you are working on one of these units that has the older connection, because you won't be able to complete that circuit without that communication cable. So uh, we're gonna continue keeping that harness in there, at least for the foreseeable future, just in case, because there's a lot of those machines out there uh, that have that older connection to them. So we're gonna talk a little bit about the uh, active sense for the ice thickness probe. So again, on the older Indigo, the legacy Indigo machines, uh, an ice thickness probe fault would uh, cause it to go into safe mode, but due to some of the newer things that we learned about the ice thickness probe and due to the nature that it's acoustic and we're utilizing frequencies and sound levels we chose to operate a little bit differently if we get an ice thickness probe fault or the e19 and that's that means we're going to go into an active sense type of a situation uh, so so how does the ice thickness probe work so how it works is the machine is running for the first six minutes of every single free cycle we're locked into that free cycle as the control board is listening for the ambient around this acoustical ice thickness probe uh, this machine might be located in a quiet ambient it might be located out in the middle of a factory where they're stamping out parts all the time and we're utilizing sound to initiate the harvest cycle in these machines and so as a result even if this machine is located out in the middle of a factory where they're stamping out parts all day long at some point the shift ends they shut all their equipment off and they all go home so it goes from a noisy ambient all of a sudden to a quiet ambient and we need this acoustical ice probe to be able to adjust with that changing sound so for the first six minutes of every single freeze cycle we'll be monitoring the frequencies back to the control board through that acoustical probe and we're going to set an, an average we're going to set a threshold once we set that threshold and, and and it could be a little higher it could be a little bit lower it depends on uh, how much noise is around that machine at that very time but once that frequency is set uh, the control board then will look for that change uh, in the frequencies as ice makes contact with that ice thickness probe so once we get that uh, threshold set the control board needs to see those frequencies exceed uh, go up over 3000 higher than where it started and so once it goes above 3000 from its set point that's telling the control board all right i've got ice touching me right now i'm going to initiate a harvest cycle but if we have an active ice thickness probe fault, maybe something happened where we had ice contacting the ice thickness probe, maybe something else uh, was, was creating an issue, maybe the ice probe itself can't work at all. And so we would set our, our frequencies way too high. We couldn't exceed it past that uh, six minute lock in. And that was cause a little bit uh, of a, um, a freeze up in the past on the older machines, or it may actually initiate uh, a, um, thaw cycle in the event that we have a big chunk of ice on that evaporator grid and we can't draw open that uh, water curtain within that seven minute maximum harvest time then this is going to cause the machine to go off uh, and, and go into a thaw cycle and then try to restart to see if the issue clears and if not uh, after a while we will go off on a safe limit number two in that event so active sense is going to change a little bit on how we were looking at that again we're looking at that uh, six minute lock-in we're looking at those frequencies but now we've got some historical data there uh, in the control board so in the detailed description for the alert we'll find the e19 we'll get into the ice thickness probe fault we'll see how many times it's occurred and the last date and time that it occurred but uh, the alert name and information is going to look a lot the same as the water level probe information but from time to time we may see a timer or and a uh, clock icon in the display this tells us that we've entered into our active sense so as again it's firmware vision uh, revision 8.6 or later all current production does have active sense as part of that so in the event that we do flag an ice thickness probe fault 
We're not going to show safe mode in the display. It'll stay freeze, but you'll see that uh, that timer and that little clock icon show up in the display, telling us that the control board looked back at this historical cycles. It went through a six minute lock in to set the threshold, but it got some information from the ice probe that it didn't like. It says, you know what? I don't think I can trust my ice probe right now. I can look back at my historical data and see how long I've been in the free cycle before and kind of take an average there. And I'm gonna do a timed free cycle now. And now it's gonna count down when the time to harvest timer hits zero, the control board at that point will initiate the harvest cycle based on that uh, ice, uh, based on those historical cycles. So. If we do see that in the screen, that means we have an active ice thickness probe fault. We're going to recommend that you do a scratch test to determine if the ice probe and the control board are functioning properly. If our scratch test passes, uh, basically just unplug the machine and plug it back in, restart it. Let's forget about some of that historical data. Maybe it had bad data. Uh, and so we can kind of force that control board to start over a little bit. Uh, however, if one of the uh, components fail the tap test, either the control board or the ice thickness probe, then we just identified why we were getting those active ice thickness probe faults. We can replace the faulty component and put that machine back into normal operation. So how do we do this uh, tap test or this scratch test? And with the uh, acoustical microphone in there, uh, the ice thickness probe is looking to make contact with the sheet of ice. This is going to be a very critical adjustment. The adjustment for this ice thickness probe, we want the little bump on the backside of this ice thickness probe to be exactly an eighth of an inch away from the evaporator grid. We knew it would be really difficult for service technicians or, or even customers in the field to verify that the little bump on the backside is exactly an eighth of an inch away from the grid. So we, from day one, came down here to the very bottom of the probe where it's easy to get to the flat part of the probe to the face of the grid. If you have 930 seconds or for our Canadian neighbors way up north, a seven millimeters, uh, then that, that ice thickness probe is indeed uh, set at the position that it needs to be set in. And uh, we should be able to initiate a harvest cycle at the proper time with the proper thickness of ice on the evaporator grid. So in order to perform a scratch test on this control board with the ice thickness probe, once again, this is word for word the way it is in your technician's handbook. Step number one, if we have ice on the evaporator grid, we need to get that off first. We can initiate a manual harvest through the service menu. Once we initiate the manual harvest and the ice falls off, we're gonna turn the machine off. We're gonna turn it to the off state, and then we're gonna kill power to the entire machine. We're gonna power the whole unit down. Once the unit is powered down, we'll go ahead and take a look at the ice thickness probe. Look for cracks, look for dents, look for dings, look for swelling. If it's warped, if, if there's anything that does not look right about the ice thickness probe, get a new ice thickness probe in there. The next step then would be to move on and verify that it is adjusted at the proper distance. We know that at that 930 seconds or seven millimeter gap from the bottom flat part of the probe to the face of the grid, that'll give us exactly where we need to be on that sheet of ice. We can also take a look at the wire that comes over to the ice thickness probe from the control board. Is there a twist to it? Is it caught in the top cover? Is there anything preventing that ice thickness probe from moving sweet uh, and swinging freely and unobstructed, no resistance out in front of the evaporator grid? If all of that checks out, we'll power the unit back up. Once we power the unit back up, we'll go into the service menu, uh, go into the data, real-time data, and uh, under the input area, and we're gonna look to see um, what frequencies the control board is hearing back from the acoustical ice thickness probe. We're gonna look at the 100 hertz and the 120 hertz. If you are international and you're on 50 hertz uh, power, those numbers will be a little bit different, but in the 60 cycle or 60 hertz uh, voltage ratings, we'll be monitoring the 100 hertz and 120 hertz frequencies on that unit. Uh, we're going to make sure that uh, we're going to grab a hold of the ice thickness probe and we're going to start just making light contact to the bump on the ice thickness probe. Also, before we do that, we'll make sure and see what frequencies we're reading. One of the things that does come in from time to time to technical support uh, technicians will say, hey, I'm getting ready to do this scratch test on your ice thickness probe. I'm looking at these numbers. What are they supposed to be? 
Unfortunately, that's a, a question and technical support we're not going to be able to ever answer for you. It'll depend on what the current sound levels are around the machine. So only the technician sitting in front of the machine has the ability to determine where those numbers should be because it will depend on, on the ambient sound. But once we've made that middle note, we're going to start tapping once again on the bump on the back side of the ice thickness probe for 10 continuous seconds. We want you to do it for 10 seconds. Once again, the control board only needs it to go uh, above 3000 from where we started. But if you really do this test for 10 continuous seconds, it wouldn't be uncommon uncommon to see those numbers go up into the eight, nine, ten thousand range, somewhere along those uh, lines. If during the tap test you get those numbers to go up that high uh, or by 3000 or more, we do not have an ice thickness probe problem. Maybe we addressed it by adjusting it uh, or, or verifying that gap distance. If those numbers go up that high, the ice thickness probe and the control board are both functioning as designed. And if we suspect that there is a problem in the unit, we got to find something else creating it. It's not related to the ice thickness probe. But what if the numbers don't change? What if we were tapping on it for that 10 seconds and the numbers never moved? Or maybe they started to go up, but not by 3,000 or more. Or maybe they started going up, but then they started coming back down, even though we were still tapping on it. Well, that's not the way it's designed. One of those two components, either the ice thickness probe or the control board, are not functioning properly. So what are we going to test? Well, we're only going to test the control board. If we did not see those numbers change at all, obviously we we'll want to make sure the ice thickness probe is indeed plugged onto the control board. If it is, disconnect it, find the positive and negative terminals, and go to the, uh, <clears throat> I just skipped way ahead, sorry. We'll go ahead and go to the uh, positive and negative terminals, get our meters out, switch them to the DC range. We're looking for 3.25 to 3.35 volts DC. I don't care if it's a positive or negative, as long as we're reading within that 3.25 to 3.35 volts DC. If we are reading the proper voltage from the control board and we failed the tap test, we're going to replace the ice thickness probe. However, if we failed that tap test and we're not getting the proper voltage, we're going to replace the control board. So that's kind of a nutshell as far as what uh, uh, active sense and the safe mode are entailing, especially in regards to the um, Indigo Next. Uh, it did start after software version 8.6. And so if you've got the older version software, we can always update the firmware by going to manitowocice.com, uh, clicking on the download software, <coughs> I'm sorry, download firmware that we can find in our service menu there, there is no charge for it, but you do have to go get it. You will have to download that and put that onto a USB drive. Once you've got that firmware on your USB drive, you can then go to the control board of the machine, uh, go to the uh, service menu, uh, go to USB, put your USB drive in there and tell the control board to upgrade the firmware. Uh, the whole process can take anywhere from 10 to 15 minutes. There's a bunch of different files the control board will be looking for. Once it gets done, it'll recycle itself, check for any updates, and then come up in the off state with the orange lock triangle showing up on the display. We can then unlock the screen and put that machine back into normal operation. Hit the machine information icon. Make sure that we did get the firmware updated on that unit. Our current software as of today is going to be 9.2. Uh, we will have this uh, webcast recorded and available for later. So that is always subject to change depending on how uh, long after uh, you uh, we did this webcast that you're viewing it. So uh, once we get all that done, we can recycle power and check for normal operation. So we've got some upcoming webcasts. Uh, we're trying to keep them again a little bit shorter uh, than the hour long. We're trying to keep them at 30 minutes or less. We just want to hit some high points and, and share that information with you. So June next month, we'll do the NEO and cool air float switch operation and troubleshooting. July, we're planning on doing recovery processes for air, water, traditional remotes, and our quiet cube line uh, for the proper refrigerant recovery uh, pr uh, procedures for those units. Uh, August, we're planning on uh, using and converting our thermistor temperatures in Indigo and Indigo Next so that we can understand what kind of potential uh, pressures we're running within our refrigeration systems. In September, we're going to utilize uh, the sequence of operation 
and understand the sequence of operation and use that sequence of operation as a troubleshooting tool uh, on that unit. October, we're planning on doing a heavily scaled up ice machine, how we're going to clean those, the proper cleaning procedures. And then in November, we'll do the quiet cube and remote headmaster operation and troubleshooting on our uh, on, on those particular models. And then December, we're planning on utilizing Indigo and Indigo Next event log or alert log navigation and using that information in there to our advantage. And as the new year comes in, we're going to talk a lot more about additional technical support resources. By the time January uh, rolls around, our intent is to have a lot more uh, how to and troubleshooting videos available to you uh, on our website. And we're going to kind of talk a little bit about those additional technical support resources that they'll be available to you uh, to assist you while you're out in the field. So that brings us to the end of our webcast. Our webcast is um, again going to be uh, available as a recording later, but at this point now you should see uh, a link in the chat section. There's also a QR code showing up on your screen. We're going to invite you to go into our, our uh, quiz. It'll take you to a quiz. You'll provide your, um, your um, name, your email address and things like that, uh, and then go ahead and answer a few questions. We'll see how we did and uh, how well you understood the information we're doing. And then once you submit your quiz, because you supplied your email address as a reward for submitting the quiz, we'll go ahead and send you a certificate and a PDF version of this uh, recorded webcast. So we appreciate everybody for joining us. I hope uh, everybody was able to get something out of this today. And for now, I'm gonna say goodbye. Good luck with your quiz and uh, we'll see you next time.